I hope you're all doing well. Hope Hashem is protecting you and your families. It's Thursday night here in Israel. Thank God Shabbos is coming. You can already feel the, the settling of the energy of the week. It's been quite a week, I'm sure, for people in America. It's been a little bit not normal, but uh, I guess it ain't over. But we are we are here and we're with the, with the Torah of Hashem. And thank God we have the, these traditions and teachings to turn to to illuminate ourselves and hopefully the rest of the world. Tonight we are gonna work in some very powerful concepts that uh, I've been working with many years in my own practice and service and kind of trying to bring them all together that they can be shared in a useful and meaningful and practical way. You know, one of the, the, the ideas that I always carry with me is this, is the, idea of demystifying the mystical. You want to take these high, broad, spiritual concepts that we get from Kabbalah and Hasidut, and we want to bring them down, bring them down to where they, they're meaningful and useful and practical to us. That's what demystifying the mystical is about, because tonight we're going to talk about the letters of creation. I think the title of the class was Becoming the Letters of Creation, which is not a small uh, metaphysical, <laughs> you know, cookie to, to swallow. It's uh, quite a, a large idea to become a letter of creation. But when we enter the concepts and we start to talk about them, you're going to see that it's actually, it is a very great, tremendous, transcendental idea. The letters of creation, the letters of God's speech that he used to create the world and write the primordial Torah with, and the letters that are still alive and active throughout the universe, because when God does something, it doesn't stop getting done. Nothing God does in holiness and is uh, touched by death. That's the nature of our own definition of God, that he is that which does not die, and therefore anything that's attached to him does not die. And that, of course, is the root of why we believe in the eternality of the soul and reincarnation and all the other big concepts that um, the rabbis have been teaching us for thousands of years. When you realize that part of you doesn't die, then all the things, sudden all these other concepts start to fit together. Even one of the most difficult, of course, is the idea of the revival of the dead. Like when I first heard that, I said, what is this? Hollywood, you know, we had a movie like that, right? Uh, <laughs> the, the dead came back to life in the graveyard. But it's not exactly, I think, uh, meant to be <laughs> Hollywood, you know. I think we're talking about the portion of us that is attached to Hashem is simply put back into a, a form that will transcend the, our, our, our knowledge and experience of a three-dimensional world that we live in. Okay, so how do we become a letter of creation? And well, what good is that? How does that help us? How does it make us better people, happier people, more effective people, and, and closer to God. Well, we're going to begin with some introductory thoughts, and then we're going to flow with these for a while, and then we'll do a meditation, as always, and then we'll talk about it. So the first um, idea is one that we have from the Baal Shem Tov. He speaks about it uh, in several places in the, the famous uh, work of the Baal Shem Tov on prayer is called the, um, par, it's in Parshat Noah of the Sefer Baal Shem Tov. And it's all about, it's called the Shar Tefillah. And it, the gates of Tefillah of the Baal Shem Tov, he tells us, you are where your thoughts are. So that idea is very interesting. I'm sitting in my room in Israel. You're sitting wherever you're sitting uh, in, in the world. Now, if you all of a sudden think of the Kotel Maravi, are you at the Kotel Maravi? Well, no, I mean, I'm still sitting in my room in, in, in Gush Etzion, you know, and the Kotel is uh, 25 kilometers north. Am I there or am I here? But when these rabbis make these statements, they're not trying to wow us or blow our minds or trying to... Uh, hide something. 
they're stating a fact that we need to understand. And so when the Baal Shem Tov says, we, we are where our thoughts are, he's really telling us that we are bound to our thoughts. I am not my elbows and my fingers and my knees and my, you know, I used to have hair, you know, I'm not those things. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I am my thoughts. That's where we live. We exist in our thoughts. From the moment we wake up until the moment we go to sleep and even in our sleep, we, we use thought as a vehicle for transcendence that we call dreaming. We can receive things when we dream. And the truth is when we get sensitive enough, we can receive things when we're awake. But it's all happening at the level of thought. So when the Baal Shem Tov says you are where your thoughts are, he does not necessarily mean your physical self. But your true self, your spiritual self, is wherever you think of. Now, if you studied any of the, you know, practices of various other psychic disciplines, which, you know, there are many books written about this, uh, some CIA programs, KGB programs about remote viewing, it makes a lot more sense because it's all happening up in the mind, but the mind is your true spiritual vehicle. Your mind is your spaceship, and you can go wherever you program it to go. Not like you say, Avram, I, I don't need that advice right now. I just need to get through the day. I need to get through Corona. I need to get through my boss. I need to get through this marriage, right? whatever it is. And it's true. Those things are more important at, at this time in your life. But what we're talking about here is a lifetime skill to elevate and illuminate everything you do, whether it's you're praying from a sitter or you're sitting on an island or on the beach, and or you'd like to be sitting on an island at the beach. And you say, well, I am where, I thought, where my thoughts are so I can imagine myself on a beach under a palm tree with a nice breeze and the waves coming ashore and it, it's kind of a, an exercise of imagination is the way we are taught to approach it. But when we approach it from the side of Hasidut in Kabbalah, we understand that all those details, the side of the, you know, a beach on the ocean, they're only symbols that we use to create a picture of where my heart wants to be. And so as I'm creating the picture, I'm actually transporting part of myself there. But I'm not transporting my feet there necessarily or my, uh, you know, my hands. But I'm transporting the part of my mind that can go there. So again, when the Baal Shem Tov says, you are where your thoughts are, we have to be careful where we send our thoughts. Because we activate energies in those places. Now, let's say you have a relative that you love and you miss and you haven't seen for a while. So you can sit down and meditate and do the practices that we've been doing for weeks now, months. Quiet your mind, breathe deeply, clear the empty space, your inner vision theater where you can see things. And let's say you want to see your grandmother. You can picture your grandmother in her living room, in her rocking chair, with her little knitting, you know, and the, <laughs> the TV's going, and uh, grandpa's in the kitchen, and et cetera. You flesh out the picture. You can go there. You can visit her. You can whisper in her ear. Will she hear it? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on how clear your filter is. Now, this is a very high-level type of practice, but we're Jews, and we're practical people, and we, and we, you know, I don't need to visit grandma. I can pick up the phone. Very good. But, you know, a lot of people have suffered tremendously during this corona period because they can't visit the ones they love. And the ones they love are, are locked away in places uh, that they're not allowed to have guests. So all of a sudden, things start to change. And these skills might have more practical application. And I could tell you that um, 
when you do those types of meditations and then you call the person and they say, I was just thinking of you. Well, now you understand why they were just thinking of you because perhaps you were, your presence, your spiritual presence was near them at the time. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but in the context of all the meditating that we've been doing here, when the Baal Shem Tov says you are where your thoughts are, and then you put your thoughts into the Yud and the He and the Vav and the He of God's name, where are you? Well, you're with God's name. But we say three times a day, Hashem Ushmo Achad. Hashem Achad Ushmo Achad. On that day, God and his name will be one. So when you are one with God's name, you are one with God. So it's not a small thing to meditate on God's name. It's not just another graphic your play, card that you're playing in your mind. And perhaps you add in a vowel, and then we chant the, the letter, and it's consonant sound. And, and all those things are, are important because we're vibrating something inside us, but it's connected to something along the chain of soul that connects the finite to the infinite. Okay. So, Rabbi Nachman has a Torah that goes along these lines like this. Now, this is very, very powerful, and it's not so easy either. I, I have to be honest. But he says, when you pray with all of your strength, all of your strength, not just the normal, you know, I go into synagogue and I open my siddur and I say, Ashrei Yoshe Vetechod, you know, and then I dab in the Amida and say Kaddish and Aleinu Lishabech and good night, guys. We'll see you later. That's not really using all my koach. That's maybe 10% or 20%. Or maybe you're really into it or you're really excited or you're desperate. You know, the Rambam, the shot of prayer in the Rambam is, is not the Amida. It's the, the, the Chiyuv Doraita, the Torah's obligation of a Jew to daven is when you're in desperate straits, when times are tough, when you're afraid and you you're, don't know where to turn. That's the mitzvah Doraita that God says, turn to me then. All the other mitzvot of prayer that we do is, is what's called the, the Rabbanan. It's later, the latter rabbis made decrees and, and practices to help keep us buoyant, to keep us uh, on our spiritual track. But the original idea of prayer is simply crying out to God because we're in, we, we need help. Okay, so it's important to remember that because... When we understand what's from the Torah and what's from the rabbis, we get some perspective. We get some sense of the change or the transformation of our work over history. That the Jew that we are today is not the Jew that we were three, 4,000 years ago in the desert. That we are different people, but we carry a spark of something that came long before the beginning. Okay, now... So what he says is like this, Rabbi Nachman. He says, when you pour all your strength, I mean, you know, you ever like make fists and squeeze your fists as hard as you can and flex your muscles as hard as you can and, 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 use, and, and use every ounce of strength in your soul in your prayer. Now, that's not an easy thing to do, but I bet if you're a health club member and you're trying to set a new record, a personal record of bench press or, or, you know, cling and jerk where you're pushing all the weight above your head, you're very easily going to be putting every ounce of strength you have in there, in there to set that personal record. So if I'm willing to do that to build muscles, why am I not willing to do that to build my spiritual muscles? To put that much power into prayer? And, and, and it takes a person like Rebbe Nachman to come along and tell us why. Because when you put all your power into the letters of prayer, he says, those letters of prayer become the letters in God's mouth, those letters of creation, that you literally activate the letters that he uses to create the creation every moment. Because the world wasn't created and then stopped being created. The world is being created every moment. And, and that's the essential belief. Tamid Maaseh Bereshit, that every day in his goodness, always God is renewing the works of creation. It is a continually created project here we live in. It is not something that was and that 
will stop being some someday. It's continuing every day to be recreated. So what we're trying to do is reattach to that godly recreation of creation in our prayer through these letters of prayer by pouring all our soul into the letters. Now, this is a big piece of work and it's not easy and we're not going to, I don't portend to sit here and try to show you how to do that. I can describe it because I've tried to do it myself. But it's the kind of thing that, you, you know, you put on your talus, you're sitting alone in the forest, you're in a place where you totally feel safe and private, and, and you cry out to God with all your strength. It's a different level of experience completely than what we call prayer, as we know it, going to the synagogue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, something seems to happen. <laughs> I hope you're all still there. But my screen has changed. I must have touched a button in my moment of excitement. Uh, here we go. So now I'm back to you. Uh, I was in some Zoom ad. They 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 captured me, and <laughs> they zoom me out. We're we're trying to zoom in. You know, that's really what it's about, folks. Is that we're going to zoom in. So, but this type of practice that we're describing about it, pouring our soul into those letters, you can only do it maybe for thirty seconds, twenty seconds. I don't know because you can literally reach the end of your tether as it's called you know where, where you feel like your soul is leaving your body and we don't want that to happen here you know but the idea though is is important as a model for us to understand the outer limits of prayer we can understand where we are in the midst of our level that we're at each of us individually and the idea of how meditation helps us okay so it, if you find yourself in a desperate situation, th this is where I go. When things are really desperate, this is where you got to go. Because that's where you attach yourself to those letters that change creation. According, and this is where it says, Sadiq goes there, Now, I'm not saying that I'm a tzaddik or any of us are tzaddikim. But for that moment of prayer, you are. For that isolated moment of desperate need and desire for God to work something out, for us, we are at that Bechinan aspect of Tzadik. And if you make the decree and, and your prayer is no longer simply a request, it becomes an active, conscious force for changing reality. Because it's no longer you. Because remember, all of you is poured into those letters. And so it, it's something that you have to experience, but it is something that um, it is uh, once you do, I promise you, you will look at prayer differently because you are, it's no longer you praying. Something takes over inside you. I've had this at different times over the years. And it's like one time I left the mikveh in the old city in the middle of the Arab quarter and I was praying and I literally stopped and my mouth kept praying. Like I wasn't doing the praying. And I'm telling you, my mouth was moving and I was like, I was in shock. But I already had understood these teachings. And so I understood that I was experiencing something of what was being talked about here. And so, okay, but where does this help us where we're going tonight? Well, what we want to do is understand is that these letters that God uses to speak creation into existence, they're in the air. They're everywhere. They're happening all the time. Because God is not a three-dimensional being that's, you know, speaking to the to the north or the south. He's multidimensional, speaking in all directions at once. And we need to break the, the, our three-dimensional paradigm down in our mind and see it in that bigger picture. 
Okay. And when you do, it makes a lot more sense. Well, if God's praying everything into creation and he's praying me into being, then maybe I'm not so far from those letters and from that transformation. And then I can plug into it. Now, but as we've talked about over the weeks also, you know, we have this place we can go when we close our eyes. I call it the inner theater. It's the screen that you can see in front of you. And, and many, many people have said over the years, well, I don't see anything. But the tool we have to understand is that our mind is a both a camera and a projector. That we can send out images and we also receive images. And the, what we're trying to do is to open up the inner eye. It's the eye that projects outward. Because when we can project images in our mind, then we can actually guide creation according to a certain idea or a certain place that we want to go. Now, this is not a new idea for anybody who studied New Age. You know that 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 visual guided visual meditations is very common. It's been around for for a long time. What the Kabbalah does is steps in and says, "Don't just meditate on getting a new yacht, or get you know on uh, material items in general, but rather let's focus on attaching ourselves to the Creator to become His servants in this world." That's another entire agenda completely. And that's really where Judaism steps off the platform of all the other religions, where we are not going to insert our agenda into the vision frame. We are asking for him to send us his agenda, whatever it is for whoever you are, because his agenda is a guaranteed success. First of all, whatever it might be. And maybe what I'm praying or visualizing, trying to create in my mind's eye, maybe it's his agenda, maybe it's not. And this is really the, the, the cutoff to, uh, of where our faith begins, because as long as I'm conjuring my idea of what should be, I might have it right by God and I might not. But when I throw myself onto him, and onto his vision for my life, who I am to be, who I'm now today, and who I should be in the future, etc. Then that's really where you make yourself into a vehicle, a vessel for Hashem. Because you push your own agenda aside. Now that's not easy work, but you see that it makes sense because if I want, literally, I want to cleanse my mind in order that he can put a piece of his mind in my mind in other words that i can receive from a higher das a higher knowledge well then then you've done something but as long as i sit and you know i remember back in high school of 30 what 30 40 years ago you know <laughs> you know we would do visualizations but it was always about a new job a new car a new girlfriend you know whatever whatever the world was telling me i needed you know that's what i would visualize they call it treating in new age i would do treatments for it, which is a strange trend. They didn't want to use the word prayer. It was, but it was basically guided visualization. So it, it takes a while to, to, to erase that, that personal agenda. But when we do, you see that things start to happen in a different way entirely. Okay. So what we're going to do tonight, though, is we're going to try to open up that theater. And we're going to do some very specific meditations to do that. Now, in the Sefer Yetzirah, the book of creation that's attributed to Avram Avinu, in the opening chapters, he talks about the creation of consciousness itself. Now, he doesn't say it, call it consciousness, because that's a modern word in English. But he tells us that there is a depth of goodness, a depth of evil, a depth of truth, a depth of falseness. And so on, he goes through the 10 spherot, the 10 traits. 
But what Hashem is actually doing is he cre he's creating consciousness in the midst of his own infinity because he, he wants to bestow this consciousness onto us. So imagine that you, you live in outer space in, in complete utter darkness and you want to start creating your own mind. So that's what he's doing in the beginning of, create, uh, of Sefer Yetzirah. And these depths, the, the commentators define for us are the spherot because they're not limited, they're not finite. So when we talk about goodness, we talk about an extreme idea of ultimate goodness, no admixture of evil. And then there's the other extreme of goodness is evil, the exact opposite of goodness. Now, these traits that we're talking about that it speaks of over there, they're helping measure distance psychically. Because, you know, we, in, in the psychic realm, in the world of your mind, there is very little distance. You have two ears that are, you know, what, six inches apart? Well, certainly that's not what we're talking about. But we're talking about the projected mind space of your inner eye. And so when we talk about psychic distance, we're not talking about physical distance, six inches, five inches, whatever it is. We're talking about the distance in quality of one trait and another. Okay, now that idea might be strange to you. But think about it like this. that Let's say you're standing next to a person back to back. And he's thinking about being in China and you're thinking about being in, in Europe. Are you in the same place? Well, according to the Baal Shem Tov, you're not. You're standing right next to each other. You are in basically the same space, but your mind is in Europe and his mind is in China. So you're not in the same space. And, and vice versa, if a person is standing in China and thinking about being next, uh, you know, at the Washington Monument, and you're standing in, in Siberia, and you're thinking about being at the Washington Monument, then actually both of you are in that same place, according to the definition that the Baal Shem Tov gave us. So what that, that shows us that physical distance is not d important to us when we're talking about the mind. We're talking about spiritual distance means how much I resemble the other. If I want total goodness and you want total goodness, then we are very similar people. Now, if I want uh, the opposite of goodness and you want, oh, a person wants total goodness, then they're in completely opposite, distant places from each other. So I wrote this down, and, and I think it's a useful sentence to remember, uh, just to help understand it. So that's so why two people can be very close physically and very far spiritually. Now, as a marriage counselor, believe me, <laughs> I think most of you can understand that. You can, you, you can live in the same house and be very far from each other, or vice versa. You can be physically very far from each other, but spiritually, you're very close because you have the same values, the same agenda, the same mindset, the same, that when you imagine a vacation, someone else is imagining the same vacation, you're in the same place. Now, spiritually, of course, this is also the case uh, when we talk about uh, the traits or the qualities that we want to achieve. Let's say a person wants to be humble. So they're naturally going to be attracted to other people who want to be humble. And let's say you're a person who wants to be um, very dedicated. So you're going to attract and be connected to people who are very dedicated and so on and so forth. So these traits are really the definitions of what we call, what I call here psychic distance. It depends on what we want and how similar we are. Because similarity means closeness and dissimilarity means distance. All right, so these, these parameters of, of, the, of the psychic mind, the inner mind, 
and I hope I don't I don't want to lean too hard on this word psychic because it sounds too fancy and we're not going off to to get our reading done by a medium over at you know <laughs> some haunted house right we're talking just simply about your inner mind the place that you go when you close your eyes that's all it is but for most of us the, the place where we go we're close those eyes is just a blank black space and so we want to try to open that up and that's what we're going to do tonight in our meditation what I'm trying to describe is why we do that is because when we open up that space, we have a we created a space for Hashem to come close to us. Okay, because he did that in the beginning of creation. The first thing God had to do to create this universe was to make an empty space within himself in order to create. And so when we create that empty space in our mind, we are, so to speak, we are mimicking the first act of creation to make an empty space inside to create something else. In this case, in, his, in God's case, it's the entire universe as we know it. In our case, it's simply, a, 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 so to speak, a room, a space that we can receive and pro- images and project them as well as give over voices and receive voices as well. Okay. Now we've worked, we've talked, and we, I, I believe in the early, it must be two months ago or more, we did a meditation about, if you remember, about being a, a child of the king and being locked out of the palace. You, you went away on a vacation, you went away on a trip, whatever it was, and you came back home and it was late at night and the palace was locked out to you and you couldn't get in and no one recognized you. So I, I use this image as, a, as just as a metaphor to understand what it should feel like that I can't even penetrate my own mind. Now think about that statement for a minute. I live in my mind all day long, every day of the year, and yet I can't even penetrate my own mind. That's, that's, that's not a good feeling. That's like being eg- in exile within yourself. And, and once uh, <clears throat> someone asked Rav Kaduri if, <laughs> if he could um, read people's good deeds and bad deeds, and the Rav smiled and says, I only want to read people's good deeds. But what the idea, oh, Rabbi Nachman says simply that if your mind is pure, you can tell where other people are at. And that's a gift. But it's a gift that you have to work at by emptying your own mind. So what we're trying to do here is create that empty space and empty the mind. Now, emptying the mind means both of images and of sounds or voices. So to quiet the mind, we breathe deeply, we settle our consciousness, we we remove distractions, both external and internal. Now, ultimately, we need to do things like tshuva if we carry around resentments with people. We've got to let go of those. Those will, rem- those will continue to be blocks to our work. If we've been through stuff and we haven't finished it and we haven't forgiven and we haven't let go, then that's gonna that's like um, carrying around a, a heavy weight and it, it just gets old after a while and it, and it blocks our reception of the higher soul that we're after. Okay, so that's, but that's individual work that we have to do on our own. I don't think we're all gonna sit here now and start doing chuva and crying about all the, the relationships that we've had that have failed and the decisions we've made that we feel bad about and whatnot. That's the private work of tshuva. But when we do that tshuva, that work, you clear the mind. And then your mind is free and open to receive and to project as we're going to do. Okay, but remember, what we're trying to, what we're going to try to do now, we're not going to try to project a new, a new apartment or a, a new spouse, or whatever the things that we need in life. What we're going to simply try to do is use the letters as we know them as tools for digging deeper into psychic space. Imagine yourself in the middle of a mountain. You just went down into a tunnel of a coal mine. And then in this dark coal mine, you know, you're just surrounded by darkness. And there's this giant mountain above you. And we've got to dig our way out. And the way we do it is with these letters. So think of I, I think of the letters oftentimes is like it's like a, a, a chisel. 
or a pick, you know, that the miner uses to pick away at the mountain. We are picking away at the darkness with the light. And the light is our own consciousness. Okay, so that, that's a useful metaphor to remember that uh, if, if we feel like we're just in, surrounded by darkness, we probably are. But, but consciousness itself is light and it has the power to penetrate this darkness. And, and, and Sefer Yitzir goes on to tell us about how Avram Avinu would carve with the letters and he would weigh the letters and he would compare them. And, and so this, you know, I, I once thought of it, you know, have you ever seen um, carpenters when they first show up at the job <laughs> sometimes? Uh, they, they compare their, their, their this one that wants to see this guy's new got a new saw this guy got has a new new drill new hammer whatever you know they're like tools of the trade so you know if you're a carpenter you're interested in those tools and you're interested in the other guys that are like it's this new great saw you can't believe it people like to it's same thing with people that like guns they compare their guns it, it, these are tools in this world well well the tools of the of a jew a spiritual Jew, a meditating Jew, are the letters, okay? And so what I want to do first, how are we doing on time? We're doing okay. What I want to do first is have everybody, I'm going to ask a simple question. Right. If you can't, then we'll supply an answer. But does everybody out there have a favorite letter? You know, there's 22 letters in the Aleph Bet. And some of you might have a favorite letter some of you might not it's okay but if you if you have a favorite letter i would like to i would like you to choose that letter okay some people it's the first letter of their name some people it's a part of a verse whatever it might be choose a letter that's your favorite letter <clears throat> now there's a reason for your choice uh, based on who you are and what your experience in education etc is but you must have a letter and you must know how it looks so if you have a book or a sitter or something in front of you you have to be able to see the letter with your physical eye and know what it looks like okay so like i'm avraham one of my favorite letters is aleph well that's not a big surprise right Aleph is, is the first letter in the Aleph Bet. Aleph is a very complex letter. It has three parts. It, it um, is made of two yuds and a vav that are melded together. So for me, the Aleph is, becomes my image, or if you will, a <clears throat> medallion, if you will. It's a, really a kamea if you, that we write with the pen of the mind. That, that we have to, there's this idea of you actually writing letters, just like you write letters with your hand. In your mind's eye, you can write letters with an inner pen, an inner hand, okay? So once you've picked your letter, keep that letter in mind. And if you don't have one, then choose something simple like a yud. It's the simplest letter. It's just a, a dot. It's basically a dot with a point at the top and a, and a tail at the bottom. A, a yud. It's very simple. And You'll see why the simplicity will help you shortly. Now, each letter has a vowel. What's the letter of each vowel? It's the vowel of how you say its name. So if I chose Aleph, the Aleph, the first vowel is, the, is a, what's called a patach, a straight dash underneath the letter. So that patach gives the letter movement. As we've learned a few weeks ago, the vowels are like the wheels of the chariot and the letters are the chariot themselves. So the chariot cannot move unless it has a vowel. But of course, movement means sounding out a letter, make creating sound. So whatever letter you've chosen, if you've chosen a mem, then the, the vowel of mem is eh, mem, right? Which is a segol, the three dots that sounded eh. Or if your favorite letter is uh, gimel, the gimel, the letter of a, of a gimel is a, a chirik one dot, which is the E sound, gimel. See, because this is going to help. We're, we're, what we're doing is generally we're, we're trying to create our own personal mantra that I hate to use that word mantra, but it's okay. No one's feelings are hurt, I hope. 
<laughs> it's just a, it's a, a, a word that everybody knows. Okay, but but this this is important. So you have your own your favorite letter, and then that letter has a vowel. Okay. Now, the detail that you see the letter is very important. You can choose a color if you like for your letter. But generally, we start with white, a bright white. At a certain point, the letter itself will shine its own color, whatever it wants to show you. So but that's, 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 a, that's a little further in the meditation process where we no longer try to control that which we meditate on. In the beginning, our nature is, I want to see an olive. So I have to see the vav and the two yuds, creating the leg and the arm of the, of the olive. And, but after a certain point, the letter becomes like a free entity and we don't control it. Now that's something that takes a, a certain amount of discipline because our nature is to try to control what's going on in our mind. But part of receiving, Kabbalah means to receive, right? Part of the idea of receiving is that I don't try to control things. I just try to let it go. I let my mind be a vehicle, a, this inner theater for Hashem to appear. But we're not looking for Hashem to appear right now. We just want to project a letter. Okay, next. Another feature is that we want to try to see the letter with three dimensions, which means a face, a side, a top, a bottom, a backside, whichever you're capable of seeing, that you should be able to see the letter as three-dimensional object. Okay. So I think that's enough for, for my pre- uh, description. We're going to start to meditate soon. So let's everybody take a break if you need and um, do what you got to do. And we'll come back in a few minutes and uh, begin. Okay, I'm just looking up one of the references to what we spoke of. Okay. So I hope everybody's back. We're going to get comfortable.
Hopefully we're already comfortable. So this meditation, like all of our meditations, we want to be comfortable. We want our feet separated and flat on the floor. Our hands relaxing in our laps. Our spine generally straight, but the, our head tilted a little bit forward. So let's begin to breathe. Inhaling through the nose, pausing at the top. Each time we exhale, notice how our voice changes becomes deeper, slower, more at peace. And each time we exhale, we remove the impurities of the day. We remove our tension. We let it fall away. We let go of whatever has bothered us. Let go of resentment. It doesn't serve us. When we use our breath like a purifying breeze, it moves through us. It takes away all the stress attention, all the things we don't need, all the energy that's not ours, and also those negative energies that are ours, simply by breathing you can feel them leave your arms, your hands, your neck and shoulders down your spine, into your hips, through your thighs and down your legs to your feet. See all that negative energy just flowing away. Continue breathing. In your mind's eye, You are one, one with yourself, one with your thought, one with your own consciousness. You might see yourself as a person who thinks but you are actually thought itself. On your screen, let it be white, clear. And if it's dark, so be it, let it be. We do not impose our will at this level. We achieve silence by letting go, 
of all those things we think we need. We achieve peace by letting go of things we think we need to change. Exhale. Inhale. Notice the pure pleasure of breathing. Notice your hands and arms feeling lighter, more relaxed. As you exhale, see your screen clear no features, no identifiers, simply pure white tablet. But this tablet is not simply a projection of your imagination. It is a function of your soul. You create it with the light of your own consciousness. For your consciousness is a camera, a movie projector. It sends out a beam before you, around you. And we can be at total peace with it as it is. But not everyone is a total peace. We accept that as well. Especially the people who are close to us. We must accept them. Who they are. And not try to change anyone but rather understand that change is from God, including changing ourselves. I'm not trying to become something new. I'm trying to become something I once was, as a pure soul, a pure child, in the beginning of time, in the beginning of God's thought. Now on the screen of your mind, I want you to project right now the letter you've chosen. See the letter, eyes closed, See that letter, its shape, its proportions, its points, its edges, a simple letter. And see then, see the letter as having depth, front and side, a roof and a ceiling to the letter. See the vowel beneath the letter. Now, where are we? We are the cameraman of this image. What is our place of perspective? Imagine that you're sitting, you're a tiny person right now. You're a tiny person who fits very nicely at the entrance to your mouth. And that your mouth is like a giant cave, a large cave. There's a soft floor, your tongue. 
I want you to walk to the back of your mouth. Face outward in the direction of your breath. And sit there. And simply marveling. I'm a tiny person in this cave of my mouth. I see my teeth, I see the palate, I see my tongue. Maybe even I see a few fillings, no problem. Just see yourself inside that place you call your mouth. You're a tiny person in a very big world. Now we're going to breathe. And we're going to breathe our letter through this cave of our mouth. And we're going to watch the letter emerge from the back of our throat, forward, into our mouth, past our teeth, pronounced by our lips, released as a field of energy into the world. So I have chosen, as I said, the letter Aleph. So now I see an Aleph in front of me and I chant. I see the letter emerge and the letter grows. It gets bigger, bigger, huge, massive, bigger than a rock, bigger than a hill. The letter becomes a mountain, a giant olive, the size of a mountain. And I am a tiny speck at the base of that mountain. See yourself as that tiny speck. See that letter. It's a mountain in front of you. Three-dimensional, massive, powerful, heavy. A mountain. It has a top. It has a bottom. It has a middle. And see a vowel beneath the mountain letter of your choice. Aleph, chant your letter flowing through you and out and up into that giant mountain as if the letter is a living thing. Aleph. I call to the letter. As you chant your letter's name, seeing it, notice it. What does it do? Does it fly away? Does it fall down? Does it move right or left? Ah, uh, left. Now see this mountainous letter, this massive thing begin to move because it's alive and it has shape and it has integrity, integrity of form. 
And on the screen of your mind, this giant letter like a mountain is going to start to pull away from you as you're breathing it. See it going deeper, uh, deeper forward in front of you, continuing to pull away with each breath. Aleph. You are not just calling a sound. You're calling being creation of God. Well, every one of these letters is alive. These are the letters of creation. We do not rule them. They allow us to manipulate them. They're ultimately only for the good. To see that living letter, the Aleph, where does it go? What does it do? Remember, you're a tiny speck. The letter keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Until you feel you have stretched yourself far into space. Until you feel your letter carries a message, a line, deep, deep into psychic space, a beacon, a beam. Now, with that letter pulling away in space, getting smaller and smaller and smaller until you see it's just a letter. And that letter though it's alive and it came from you. You created it. It is part of you. It is drawing life force from your mind. You give it life by thinking it into being. Continue breathing. Allow yourself to luxuriate in your breath. Allow yourself to feel your breath smooth, smoothly flowing through your throat, past your palate, out into the world, far, far out to your rapidly becoming invisible letter. It's gotten so small. And now you're the giant. And the letter is a tiny thing. Perhaps an image enters your mind or a sound or a voice. Take note of it. 
What does it have to say? Why is it there? So we have performed one creation tonight. We've created a letter. We set it free, alive, into the world to interact with other letters, to create words, concepts, and ultimately fields of energy. Did it leave you a message? Did it teach you? These letters are alive and they are able to teach us. Praise is all to God. The one, the only, the past, the present, and the future. Let his praise be our praise. And our praise, his praise. Whenever you wish, you may open your eyes. But do so slowly and gently. Perhaps you don't want to leave the meditation. That's also fine. Okay, continue breathing. Leaving the mouth, the cave of our mouth, leaving the apparatus of speech. Coming back to our more familiar selves. Notice whatever thoughts come to mind, how you are connected to them. Try to remember to remember anything of significance. If something is truly significant, you will remember. Memory itself is from the spark of the godly soul. when our minds are truly empty. There's a time to pray, time to request, time to request God's mercy for all people everywhere. Your prayer in the midst of meditation already has passed through many psychic barriers, thus has more power to reach the heart of heaven. Continue breathing. It is our life, life we never leave. Until forever. Okay. Well, we're here. 
And I think we reached that time. We can uh, talk a little bit, share a little bit. See, Rhonda's written to us, Rash became Rush. Very interesting. Rush as in a sound. Or perhaps Rush as a adjective or an adverb or a verb to rush, to hurry. That would be useful to answer that question, Rhonda. What did it mean to you? I know my olive started to lose its shape. So that told me that my focus wasn't very strong. And so it is often that our our focus, especially this time of night, after such a long day, etc. But as our focus gets weaker, the letters become less, uh, hold their shape less. It's just a function of the way it is. But sometimes the letters change shape because they're trying to tell us something else. So that's really more of an individual question that I work with with people one-on-one -on -one in this type of meditation where we teach the skills of interpretation. It's, it's very personal and it should be one-on-one. -on -one. Because each person is different and this is very, can be very intimate material. I'm letting go of rushing, very nice. Very nice. It went off into the sky like a balloon. Well, I bless you to never need to rush again. But our faith, when we have faith in Hashem is running the world, I don't need to rush. He's not rushing. Why should I? It's a very good meditation, Rhonda. Okay. I also, <laughs> uh, I saw an image of Trump. I don't know why, it just flashed. After my screen was empty, he kind of appeared. It only stayed a moment, but I'm just asking myself, why would that be? I haven't watched the news in a while, so maybe it's not bad. Obviously, it's on people's minds. I think it was Trump like an authority figure. Like we tend to look at these types of people as authority figures, even though they haven't earned that right. Of course, the Torah does tell us we're supposed to bless on the kings and princes of, of nations. So if that's an optional blessing, <laughs> if you don't like the guy, it's going to be hard to bless him, right? Okay. Uh, well, that's very nice of you, Rhonda, to to say I could be an empath. I actually used that word to describe somebody else recently. Um, but empathy is certainly something that we all need as human beings. And certainly if we work in the caretaker trades and then in the health professions of this world, we need to be empathic. Okay, hi Shirley. Welcome. My letter was Shin. Or do I see Sin? I 
Shia dot as a shin. The first letter of my name, the word light came to me in meditation. The word light. Interesting. Before this class, I gave a drusha to somebody about a shin. That a shin is really three vavs. Okay, three, three vavs together joined to the, the base is a shin. And shin generally represents fire. It is the letter that connects the right brain and the left brain. And the fire, of course, is a source of light. Interesting. And were you able to see your shin go off into space? Did it, did it do anything? Sometimes a letter will start to spin or change color. A letter can also turn upside down or run off in a strange direction. So each of those movements actually has significance when we learn this path. It turned pink. Well, that's interesting because pink is the color of the of Bina, the left brain. So that's uh, significant as well because the shin is the letter of that connects the right and left brain, which would indicate to me uh, that you have understanding because that's clearly the color that's representing Ima or Bina, which is understanding. Okay. Rhonda writes, I also saw shimmering white light. Was the was your race shimmering in white or the background? That's an important question because if the letter is changing colors or shimmering, that could be significant. The background is just the, 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 the space that we create or project onto. Race background was green. That's interesting. Mike says we can unmute. So if we want to talk directly without writing, that's also fine. We have a few more minutes. Am I? I guess I'm not muted, right? That's <laughs> that wouldn't work too well. Uh, it's late. What can I say? But that's good. This is how we learn. This is how we become intimate with the letters of creation. Like how they operate in our minds, what they represent. The Raish, of course, is Rosh, the head. Shin is uh, literally the word shin is from shen, the teeth, a tooth. So it might be indicative of a relation, your relationship to your teeth. Um, each letter has all those different significance. That's why I said choose your favorite letter because by identifying a letter as favorite means that it has certain significance to you. Now, you're surely, so you chose Shin because it's your letter of your first name, but clearly it's more than that. And so, so to Rhonda, so to Avraham, I do the same thing. But it's connected way back along the chain of information. I just chose Raish because I couldn't think of anything else because Rhonda begins with Raish, but my Hebrew name is Shoshana. So oh, really? Raish has Shoshana in it, too. That's interesting. If you have your computer there, uh, type, you know, there's a, there's a name significance program. Very quick uh, on, you could look up, I was interested in what Rhonda means. 
because in Hebrew, Ron itself is a name. Ron is um, connected to the name, the word Rina or song. Uh, I'm just interested or curious, but uh, okay. So I guess the next time, Rhonda, you could do this meditation yourself, obviously, and you could choose Shin if you like. <clears throat> we don't have to choose a letter in our name. It's, it's very natural that we would. But it's still it's significant uh, in other ways. Now, the background of green, that's interesting because green certainly has significance in modern culture these days in terms of ecology and uh, a natural way of living. The green in, uh, in nature, obviously, is, is that which produces oxygen, which gives us life. But in Kabbalah, green is connected with the heart and um, a mixture of red and yellow creates green. So I guess we'd have to, to ask more questions about that, but just to give us direction here. If anyone else would like to share, now would be the time. We'll say goodnight pretty soon. We'll bless you all with a wonderful Shabbat. I hope this is a useful meditation. It's something that I do practice. I don't teach it too often because there aren't that many people that... <laughs> that I've known or met that are interested, but um, you see that uh, there is what to learn in the letters of creation in the books of Kabbalah and Hasidut. That we, we, when we talk about the alphabet, we think of a letter system, but it's so much more, so much more. Isn't there a cover of a book um, about the... Uh significance of the that's olive true. base that's that, i believe that, that's a book by rabbi ginsburg and it has a picture of the the olive base maybe in a in a flame and it's sort of going up to shemayim uh i was i was remembering one from an, probably a, a publication from the 90s but uh that had an olive that looked like it was three-dimensionalized but i'm sure that there are other books with that type of cover I think uh, maybe Rabbi Trugman has a, a book on the letters as well that might have that cover. They're all good sources. Certainly Rabbi Ginsburg and Rabbi Trugman and others. Uh, and of course, each person uh, to learn in English is very good, but to practice in Hebrew is important. To practice the meditation on the letters because these, these aren't just simply letters like an A, a B, a C, and a D. Okay. So um, you can all write me if you have quest more questions. Um, I do meet people individually for these type of discussions about these things as well, if it's really involved and necessary. Um, so, but Shabbat is coming, and that is the time when we can really take the time to meditate properly. And uh, since we receive the Shabbat soul, we sh should also have more illumination in this work that we do. Amen. How often would you uh, meditate? Well, I've, what I've done is tried to use the Amidah. Since as a, you know, an Orthodox man, I would pray three times a day or try to. So, you know. Uh, the Amidah itself is a, is a standing meditation. And I will use the Bet and the Resh and the Vav and the Chaf, and that's Baruch. Uh, you could spend hours, literally. I don't, but um, it's nothing to stand a half hour if you're really going to meditate on the letters of the Amidah. And you breathe each word and see the letters and try to... to you, what you'll notice, I'm not going to give away everything, all the secrets now, because I'll be spoiling it for you. 
because uh, there's a certain level where Hashem intervenes and these letters start to, well, things happen. <laughs> I can't tell you everything. Then I'll, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, <laughs> what happens? This work is so subtle that if, 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 if a teacher tells the student everything, then you'll start to look for it. And that's not what we want. Because remember, we want to be mekabel. We want to receive what God wants to send us. And I don't want to program into your mind what you want to happen. Follow? It needs to be Fair natural. Enough. And it needs to be coming from, uh, from the root of your soul, not from my mouth. So there's a certain point where I have to be quiet and Hashem has to take over. <laughs> okay? And that's the discipline we learn over time and it's, it's necessary. But... Um, you'll begin to, uh, obvi ideally, you're going to have that connection to your upper soul. It's going to send you everything you need. And then we'll, we'll, you'll, you'll, as you have experiences, you can share it here in the class, right? And, and those experiences will be the dic will dictate to you your own path of growth. So we, it's about trust, but it's trust at a very refined and uh, sensitive level. Okay, so I'm going to say good night, Shabbat Shalom to everyone. Thank you, Mike. Everybody support the lighthouse. Without his uh, yozma, as they say in Hebrew, his perseverance and uh, dedication, this project wouldn't be happening. We wouldn't have these classes, and uh, so it should all be for bringing Am Yisrael closer and closer into the Geula process, and. Um, Support the project and and Hashem will support our work. So God bless you all. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom.